This is Digital Pathology Today. Now here's your host, Dr. Joseph Anderson. With so many potential applications and use cases in digital pathology, where do we start? How can we harvest the low-hanging fruits? How do we connect the dots and make it all work? Welcome to Digital Pathology Today. I'm Joe Anderson. Dr. Anil Parwani is professor of pathology at The Ohio State University, where he serves as the vice chair and director of anatomic pathology. He is also the newly elected president of the Digital Pathology Association. This episode of Digital Pathology Today is brought to you in part by Sectra. Sectra is a global leader in digital pathology with many years of experience of large-scale primary diagnostics. Read success stories of implementing digital pathology at Sectra.com. Dr. Anil Parwani, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. It's good to be here. Ohio State seems to be a, an early adopter and a real leader in digital pathology. You just achieved a major milestone, as far as I can tell, by scanning your two millionth slide, but we'll get to that in just a little bit. So first, maybe tell us a little bit about your background in digital pathology and and really the journey you've had so far in building the, the digital pathology program at Ohio State. Ever since I was a resident, I really enjoyed working with images. I was involved with creating unknown conferences for residents, resident review when I was a resident. And I enjoyed, you know, taking a field of view and morphologically translating it into a diagnosis. And then as I as I took my first job at the University of Pittsburgh, they were looking at early scanners at the time. And there was an opportunity to start implementing this technology for frozen section use, for remote assessment of uh, cytology specimens, and also for getting consults from overseas. So that's really when I got more heavily involved with digital pathology, and we implemented it across the enterprise for 10 years or so. And then when I came on to Ohio State, Ohio State had already started the journey to digital pathology, but there, one of the main things they were really interested in was take their data repository of cancer slides and make them available for research. In, you know, create them into digital images. And then the other objective was to create an opportunity to review these alongside with integration with the electronic medical record. We started that process, we put a team together, we worked with our vendor partners, really started the journey with a lot of help from the chair of pathology, the director of the cancer center, medical center, leadership and IT. So it was a huge team that actually helped get this done you know it wasn't just me alone and uh, you know it took a long lot of effort it took almost one year to plan the project out get the funding in place and start buying all the components so it was but it was fun it was fun to see it taking shape see pathologists getting excited about it and start using it in their daily workflow. Just listening to your experience and kind of a theme that's emerging in this podcast is there's so many different use cases for digital pathology and could be in intimidating perhaps or confusing. And I know a phrase you like to use is the low-hanging fruits. There's so many different use cases. So it could be archiving old slides for a repository. It could be uh, education. You know, So like you said, uh, unknown conferences are a big part of training uh, residents and medical students. Frozen sections perhaps could be implemented before, you know, full-scale adoption of digital pathology, maybe a real practical solution going into a community hospital or for after hours, starting off before your whole system is up and running, perhaps quality assurance, research. I mean, there's so many applications, you know, so to those out there who are new or wondering where to get started, uh, maybe did you have an, an overall philosophy about, you know, kind of what the low-hanging fruit was or where to jump in? The low-hanging fruit is really what is a problem for you today and how can you leverage digital pathology to solve it. So for us, it was getting into it for research purposes, but very soon we realized that pathologists were excited about presenting at the tumor board. Pathologists were excited about training the residents. Residents were excited about looking at unknown cases, looking at large collections of slides, which they don't have to get a physical glass slide recut. And then oncologists were really excited about the engagement from the pathologist, where they can actually see the slide. There was a conversation where the margin is. It wasn't dependent on a static image that was acquired for a PowerPoint presentation. Our philosophy has been to empower the user. And the, once you introduce it, once you introduce the technology to the users, they find very creative ways to start using it in their daily work. 
Yesterday, I had a very unusual renal kidney tumor, which was a biopsy. I was able to, within 10 minutes, show it to four different pathologists and get an opinion. And it turned out to be a rare sarcoma, angiosarcoma of the kidney. Instead of ordering 20 different immunostains and waiting for three days and exhausting all the tissue, we were able to target to targeted immunohistochemistry, find the diagnosis, fine tune the diagnosis within, within hours, not days. So I think the excitement that comes from solving a problem and, and building an application is really what our philosophy has been all about. Getting those the, the users, getting the users involved and excited. And I think as pathologists, in a sense, there's two groups of users, physician users, there's us, the pathologists, and then there's, you know, ultimately the beneficiaries of our work, the oncologists and the, and the treating physicians. And I know you've been active in promoting digital pathology to other physicians. So just in terms of those two groups, you know, how do you make the case to our own people, our own pathologists? And then how do you go about getting the oncologists and the treating physicians on board? You mentioned tumor boards, which is kind of a, an age-old tradition in pathology. And we've actually been presenting static images. It used to be Kodachromes you know, <laughs> before, the turn of the, before the turn of the century. Then somehow we got these digital cameras on top of our microscopes, when, and then we could actually quickly present the image at a, at a tumor board, taking a further step you know, and having a, a living, breathing, whole slide image that we can share with a clinician on a, on a real-time basis. So, so how do you go about getting first A, pathologists on board, and then B, the uh, oncologists and treating physicians? As soon as the pathologists can get their hands on these images, they find ways to start using them in their daily practice. So we mentioned tumor board, education, but also research. You know, like typically pathologists who do research, especially in academic institutes, they look for cases in their lab information system or in the databases. They find the blocks, they get recuts, they get slides. This accelerates that process. And if they're engaged with other researchers in oncology or endocrinology or something else, that message gets transferred over that now you can actually accelerate that research. So we started with, we started seeing a reduction in requests for glass slides from the archives for research purposes. And that translated to our oncologists and our research community asking for these images and de-identified versions of these images. So overall, we've seen the engagement from both the research side as the message has gone out. The first group, which is the pathologists who are actually using it now for their everyday work, it spills over into their other work, their other academic work. And I've seen that also in private practice settings where we have pathologists who are sending digital consults. So now suddenly they can start using these digital images for research their oncologists are asking for images. So together, it creates an ecosystem where images became an exchange of information and images became a, becomes a currency for academic progress, for clinical advancement and research, research enhancements. So all these things have contributed to the growth of the program, both on the research side and the clinical side. We're often excited about signing out cases and just the possibility of signing out cases remotely. Research, I think, is a huge beneficiary of our profession going digital because I think it used to be a bottleneck, you know, to get glass slides or even the blocks. You know, that could be a weeks to month long process, you know, where you have a, a set of cases where you maybe have clinical outcomes for or a clinician is interested in, you want to do a study. But just getting those blocks out of storage, out of the closet, takes time or the glass slides, it, it could be off site, a storage down the hall, but that takes time and now it can be almost instantaneous. Do you think this could maybe lead to a, a new golden age of tissue-based research? As long as you can link the image repository with the data repository, in other words, if you are able to build tools where if I have an interesting case and I query that image, not the diagnosis, but the image itself, and find similar images in the database and then pull all the metadata associated with those images, then we have advanced translational research into the next decade. You know, this is something we cannot easily do. If today, like you said, the glass slides are pulled, blocks are pulled, research, those, those things are 
slows down the research significantly. But if you imagine a world where I find an interesting tumor in my daily sign out, I circle it, I digitally circle it, I press a button and it goes into the database and finds me some other images. I think to me that would advanced, advanced translational oncology research significantly, not just oncology, but also medical research, because now you can now make meaningful contributions that could be done within days versus months. And what do you think about perhaps a renaissance in using histologic features, just simple H and E stain, and then applying all of this computing power, and then just the ease at which we have these images are at our disposal to develop new predictive and prognostic markers. It seemed like maybe in the 90s and early 2000s that the big focus was molecular and we needed the images, the H&E images, but often just to confirm that we got the area of interest we were looking for and that in fact this and this, that and the other mutation was actually from the area of tumor. But now do you see us making much better use of histologic features to develop tools that will benefit patients? There are two aspects to it. One, which nobody really talks about and I guess it's kind of a dark secret of digital pathology. When you think about renal cell carcinoma, and you know, like you make a diagnosis of clear cell renal cell carcinoma, and you that diagnosis and the prognostic features that you assign to it, like nuclear grade or the size of the tumor, or features that were measured for many, many, many years based on a very subjective review of one or two fields of view. But today we have a capability of within seconds reviewing the entire tumor, you know, which has been sampled and the images exist, where the computer can give you an exact nuclear grade. So think about the world where all the therapeutics that we've assigned, including immunotherapy, has been based on a lot of the subjective criteria that have existed in pathology over the years. But imagine the world where now you can start looking at things digitally and not just using artificial intelligence, but even manually. When I look at a bladder biopsy under the microscope, and I look at the nuclear features, I grade that tumor, I find it really different in many tumors and many tumor types when I'm looking at it on the monitor. Imagine a world where now everything has been signed out digitally. We will have to redefine the criteria that we use in the digital world versus the glass world and that transition and the translation will have significant meaning for the patient's therapeutic journey. That's one aspect of it. And the other aspect is really when you look at the tumor itself and you are looking at biomarkers, today we can do sequencing at a single cell level. We can use multiplexing at the single cell level. Imagine if you can couple that immunofluorescent or multiplexing with very, very discrete features, which have been hand chosen or crafted features and combine those two types of information and predict the outcome of the patient or predict how this drug might work or not. That's going to be hugely powerful, more powerful than pathologists cannot even imagine. I mean, it's going to be a new frontier of discoveries. Yeah, that is exciting, kind of marrying the H&E features with the molecular features. I share your enthusiasm, and I kind of consider it myself a second renaissance with regards to H&E features, because we know these these features are powerful. You know, we've been using them since the early 1900s when grading was first initiated by a pathologist named Eli Broder. We've known in the 1920s and the 1930s that uh, tumor grades, particularly in breast cancer, correlate with outcome. We've even known about histologic features such as tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, which is becoming a renewed area of focus, uh, correspond with outcome. But I think the downside to that was many people were skeptical, perhaps just because it was not reproducible, it was dependent on a human being who may be better or worse than another colleague or may disagree with that colleague on a particular day. You know, So I think there were those issues with subjectivity and reproducibility, which I think are going to largely go by the wayside. And like you said, we're going to be able to sample larger portions of these images. And then this the second piece of what you said, marrying the molecular and the H&E, I'm curious, who's going to own that space? You see companies 
developing these new technologies and they're calling it things like spatial genomics or single cell analysis. And I'm always scratching my head. Like what, what kind of space do they think these molecular features are out there floating in? <laughs> right. It's uh, you know, who's going to own that and what's the importance of the uh, pathologist? I think the pathologist have to be really engaged, put, a, put their stake on take in it because if they don't, this will become like the liquid biopsies of the world where, you know, you can get very, very important information from a liquid biopsy, but in the in the context of the patient and the patient's tumor and the morphology, it's not going to be as focused. If we don't take ownership of it, where we marry the concept of, okay, this is a tumor, this patient has tumor heterogeneity, this tumor, this area of the tumor is worse than this area. Perhaps the sequencing should be done at this area. That space, has to be part of pathology and it has to go back to the fundamentals of marrying the morphology with the outcomes with everything else that gets tested on it so there is a place for some of these in limited biopsy specimens or fnas or other processes where you don't have that spatial context but if you do it's going to be critical that pathologists like us get involved in it help guide that process help provide those predictive analytics with the, com with the combination of old, very, very fundamental morphology, but then combine it with the computational pathology powers and sequencing of individual cells. Or to put it another way, what I've heard many people say is that, I don't know if this is a, a dystopian future or a utopian future, that AP will essentially become CP. Uh, you know, that maybe makes some people shudder. What do you think? Have you heard comments like that? I do, but I, I think there is a lot more in AP than, than meets the eye, literally. <laughs> if you think about the complexities of tumor and how we cross it, how do we take the best sections? How do we look at those sections? How do, do we identify regions of interest? How do we read the biomarkers? There is that continuity of pattern recognition and combining the pattern recognition with appropriate tests. Without that context, I feel like the, you might be able to query, interrogate if there is a translocation present in this tumor by grinding the cells and creating a lysate and extracting the genome. But without that context of the morphology, some of that information may be misleading and, and frankly, could be dangerous. I agree with you there. It, it could be dangerous without, you know, without that expertise of the pathologist. This episode of Digital Pathology Today has been brought to you in part by JAV Advisors. With over 16 years experience, JAV Advisors focuses on business and management consulting for digital pathology and artificial intelligence in deployment within histology, pathology, and cytology laboratories throughout the world. Call 213-258-6268 for more information. J.A.V. Advisors. One of the themes of 2020 is that digital pathology is here. It's, it's real right now. It's not something that's on the horizon or we're going to look forward to someday. It's with us right now. And, you know, many people have also said the fun is really going to begin, you know, once we get the basics down, once we have workflows where all of our slides are scanned, really then we can begin to enjoy some of the fruits of this. But how do we get just to that point where we're all kind of at a, at a new baseline or a new normal? How do we get to that point where we can, where everyone's kind of on a solid, similar platform? There will be different journeys for different organizations. Some of them will go full digital. Some of them will go, you know, I'm going to only focus on these use cases. Ultimately, as the exchange of information becomes digital, right? instead of sending glass slides to another institute for a second review, you can now use links to digital slides. You can now send the information digitally. That foundation has to be achieved at a very personal level, at a very organizational level. Like There is no formula for everyone to buy all the scanners in the world, right? So there, that simply just doesn't happen, right? So the C-suite will resist that. But as institutes review the cost to benefits ratio, like how much are you going to save by improving your quality? How much will you save by improves, improving your throughput? How much are you going to save by slide load balancing? 
all those aspects will drive adoption. I think some institutes are already have made their investment, others are making their investment. In the last two years, I personally have seen several institutes take the path to digital, made a conscious decision, I'm going to do it. This is way too important. The flip side, what are the, the barriers, the speed bumps, or the impediments? You know, I think one thing is a lack of standards or a lack of uniformity or interoperability. This scanner doesn't work with images from other scanners or this AI system or computational algorithm doesn't work with my scanner, but it works with yours. What are some of the, the barriers to adoption we're, we're looking at? Interoperability is one barrier, but I don't think it's the large, biggest or the largest barrier. I think the biggest barrier is, is still the cost. Every time I want to store more images, I get an email from the chief information officer. This will cost this much. You know, you've already signed out the case. The cases are already in the electronic medical record. Why do we need to keep these digital storage? So I think the cost of the IT and the infrastructure and the storage is a bigger, bigger challenge than interoperability because there is no way that you can not have interoperability. By design, these systems were designed to have a proprietary format. They were designed you know, like the big companies, I'm not going to name them, but they focused on, so they could use this as a way of exclusivity. If you have an image format which is protected, then you're likely to use more devices, more standards, more software, more hardware from the same vendor. If you control it, just like Apple, right? You have to use iOS. Think about that. But it's not the biggest barrier because you can still live in that ecosystem with the same formats. The bigger challenge comes when you ask for more money to store those images. So where are we on storage costs? Moore's Law, supposedly cost of technology and the cost of storage is going to be going to zero over time. Is that true or is it still costly to, to store images? I think it's still very costly because it's not just storage, like it's the other costs associated with it. If you look at institutions who typically buy storage, they are forced to buy it from this vendor and because it has to be part of institutional storage environment. But if you actually look at the storage in the cloud or you look at storage outside, if you go to the free market and you're able to buy storage, it's much cheaper. The cost of storage has gone, has gone down significantly. I remember my first whole sky imaging scanner and the storage was astronomical. Today I can store 100 times more images compared to 10 years ago. So we've come a long way, but there are also institutional policies and costs that drive the cost up. If you're in private practice or you're out on your own and you, you want to buy storage on the cloud, it's become so much, much, much more cheaper. So at the end of the day, how much does it cost for you to take your H&E slide and digitize it? It should be now cents. It used to be dollars. So we've come a long way and we're going to continue to, but I, I don't think it'll ever be zero, like you said. <laughs> At least going in that going in that direction. So then once we've kind of achieved, you know, a reasonable level of adoption where we're all, where pathologists are generally working digitally, they have their slides archived and I'm sure there's going to be, it's going to become the standard across different tumor types or different disease states in various degrees of adoption, then the, the fun starts, right? We can start getting into computational pathology and other uses, which kind of require the foundation of everything being archived and everything being digitized to start with. And as pathologists, I think one of our roles is increasingly going to be to provide predictive and prognostic information. Uh, how do you see this evolving? You know, Do you see it as developing computational algorithms based on morphologic features from H&E? Um, do you see us incorporating immunohistochemistry or other or other methodologies, or even multiplexing and things like that? How do you see, what do you see as the low-hanging fruits in this area? And where do you see uh, prediction and prognosis going? I view this as like three big buckets. One bucket is algorithms and tools to help you do your everyday job, which would be to you know measure things, quantitative things, you know, count nuclei. The second bucket is helping companion diagnostics, where you have very known specific biomarkers for which you previously used to manually count those, annotate those, 
now you can actually do it digitally you can use image analysis you can use quantitative uh, algorithms to account and subclassify regions of interest and tie that to molecular data tie that to patients therapeutics and I think the biggest and the third bucket which is still very unknown to me is through computational pathology where you are building algorithms from an h &E image you're doing different tasks so you're not just counting one thing you're actually identifying objects you're identifying feature or features which collectively could make a different diagnosis or, or contribute to a diagnosis which could predict how this patient will respond to this chemotherapy which could predict based on this morphology and the tumor microenvironment this patient will is likely to respond to drug a versus drug b or even monitor treatment impact where you have serial biopsies from a patient who is on transplant or who is on chemotherapy and see the effect of the treatment on different organs so i think those three buckets will drive that field forward Dr. Anil Parwani, thank you so much for being with us. So before we wrap up, uh, tell us what, what excites you and, and how do you see the f field evolving in the next 10 years and beyond? What I'm ex most excited about are the possibilities. I'm excited about new discoveries. I'm excited about how these new tools and technologies will augment pathologist knowledge, transform how we review cases. These technologies have a tremendous, tremendous, tremendous possibilities. But I also am not sure how far we can go with the adoption. We have a very, very exciting time in pathology already and more so in the next decade. New opportunities indeed. I think we have a lot to look forward to. Well, Dr. Anil Parwani from Ohio State University and the newly elected president of the Digital Pathology Association has been our guest. We'll see you next time on Digital Pathology Today. <music>